friends, and welcome into Cross the Heart Ministry. Do you remember playing the hokey pokey when you were a kid? Do you remember that little game? Maybe you played it at recess or you sang it as you did PE class when you were a little kid. You put your right hand in, you take your right hand out, you put your left foot in, you take your left foot out, and you do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself about. What? Well, Amazingly, that's the song that kept going through my head as I was preparing this week's lesson in 2 Kings. You see, we landed in 2 Kings chapters 13 to 16, and we sort of plowed through the, the reigns of about 13 kings, nine in the northern kingdom and four in the southern kingdom, and every single one of them, they were all bad kings. Some of them made a pretense of kind of half-heartedly living for God, really just kind of wanting God to help them out of a jam, and then they were right back out again. So I just kept thinking, they were playing the hokey pokey. They were in and they were out and they were in and they were out. But more often than not, they were out. And most of them never went in. They just stayed out. They were wicked and evil and horrible kings. And so as we study their lives today, from our perspective in the 21st century, I think there's a lot that we can learn from, a lot that we can be challenged by when it comes to being women of God who want to live wholeheartedly for God. Women living today challenge challenged by the example of, of these humans that lived hundreds of years ago, but the challenge is still the same. Are we going to live for ourselves? Are we going to follow the ways of the world and the culture and do what feels or looks expedient? Or are we going to choose to be women of God who glorify God by choosing to live wholeheartedly, all in, always, and in all ways for our Lord Jesus Christ? I hope you'll stay tuned and listen to the teaching lecture in its entirety, and I hope that you'll leave us a note below and let us know how God is maybe you using these age-old truths from these historical people that lived so many years ago to challenge you to live differently in light of this truth all these years later. I hope you'll stay tuned and listen, and I hope you'll also be thinking ahead and planning ahead to study with us next fall and spring. We're, we're going to be moving back to the New Testament. If, if you follow our teaching, you know that that's our custom. We rotate back and forth from Old to New Testament, so we're finishing our series in First and Second Kings, and then we'll move to the New Testament and we'll be studying 1 Corinthians. We did Romans before, so now it's time to proceed to the very next book. If you'd like to listen to the teaching on Romans this summer to kind of prepare for Paul's letter to the 1 Corinthians, the link to that is below. If you want to go back and review all the lessons from 1 and 2 Kings, that link is below. But I also want to challenge and encourage you to study 1 Corinthians with us this fall. If you would like to purchase a study guide for either 1 1st or 2nd Kings or Romans or any of the other the studies we offer and certainly for 1st Corinthians you can send us an email here at the ministry at cross.my.heart at cox.net and we'll fix you up. But for right now stay tuned and be challenged as we watch all these kings from so many years ago in 2nd Kings chapters 13 to 16 play the hokey pokey. For Cross My Heart Ministry I'm Laura McFarland. Well when I googled the hokey pokey online. This is the picture that popped up. This is a picture that I found on Wikipedia and I learned all sorts of things about the hokey pokey. I learned that it actually did not originate in America. It originated in the UK. And this is an actual picture of women in vintage costume in Pickering at wartime weekend doing the hokey pokey in the street. And in there, over there they call it the hokey cokey. So there's your trivia for today. If you're ever playing uh, Jeopardy and you need to know what was the original name for the Hokey Pokey, it's the Hokey Cokey and it started in England. Well, if you didn't know that bit of trivia and you grew up in the 1950s, maybe you are familiar with this hit single by Ray Anthony. Maybe you remember this album cover. Who knew that it was actually a popular song in the 1950s and was recorded by this famous guy that I had never heard of. And so, um, well, and then, so even if you didn't know about the Hokey Cokey in the UK, and even if you've never heard of Ray Anthony, because many of you here weren't even born in the 1950s, much less could remember anything about it, most likely all of us know about the Hokey Pokey for elementary PE class. You can probably remember playing the hokey pokey at recess or with your PE teacher and you remember the little song you put your 
hand in, you take your right hand out, you put your right hand in, and then you shake it all about. You do the hokey pokey and you turn yourself about. You know, you know how it goes. <laughs> and then you do it with your left foot and your right foot, and then you put your whole body in and you take your whole body out. So it's a fun kind of silly song to teach your grandkids or your kids if you had forgotten about it. But the hokey pokey is a fun silly song for exercise physically, but it's no way to live spiritually. But this is what kept coming to mind as I was studying all these kings in chapters 13 to 16 this week. And boy, there were a lot of them. And I just kept thinking, they were playing the hokey pokey. They were in and they were out and they were out again. The, this is what came to mind about how all these kings just failed to really follow God. And even when they went in, they weren't really in. We eventually saw their true colors. So ladies, Ladies, we may not think about the hokey pokey completely, but that's where these kings were. And so we're going to open today by looking at one of them in 2 Kings 13, 1 to 9. 1 to 9. But this week we're actually going to look at 13 kings. We're going to sort of run through them quickly and sort of look at the highlights. But once you've studied one, you've more or less studied them all. Would you stand with me in honor of God's word as we read from 2 Kings 13, verses 1 through 9. In the 23rd year of Joash, son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, son of Jehu, became the king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned 17 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord by following the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit, and he did not turn away from them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel, and for a long time he kept them under the power of Haziel, king of Aram, and Ben-Hadad, his son. Then Jehoahaz sought the Lord's favor, and the Lord listened to him, for he saw how severely the king of Aram was oppressing Israel. The Lord provided a deliverer for Israel, and they escaped from the power of Aram. So the Israelites lived in their own homes as they had before, but they did not turn away from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, which he had caused Israel to commit. They continued in them. Also, the Asherah pole remained standing in Samaria. Nothing had been left of the army of Jehoahaz except 50 horsemen, 10 chariots, and 10,000 foot soldiers, for the king of Aram had destroyed it. The rest... Had, had destroyed the rest and made them like the dust at threshing time. As for the other events of the reign of Jehoahaz, all he did and his achievements, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Jehoahaz rested with his father and was buried in Samaria, and Jehoahaz, his son, succeeded him as king. Ladies, you may be seated. Thank you for standing in honor of God's word. And let me just pray as we begin. Father God Almighty, it's, it's been a challenging lesson. It's been perhaps the most tedious of all as we've studied king after king and saw how disappointing their, their lives really were, how they had so much opportunity and squandered those opportunities. And so, Father, as we sort of roll our eyes or breathe deeply and sigh looking at yet another J name or another A name and they all begin to run together and sound alike, Father, would you just... Which just remind us that these were real people. These were real men who led your people and, and failed in so many ways. And may their behavior convict us and prompt us to choose as women of God today to live wholeheartedly and all in for you in the generation and in the times that we live in. I, I just pray for takeaways today for all of us. I pray that as women of God, we would find truth in this tedious passage because your word never, ever returns void. And we pray that we would be convicted and challenged to live always and always to bring you glory and to make much of you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, as we... Read through, again, 2 Kings chapters 13 to 16, very tedious, very challenging, uh, all these kings that were covered. And if you've got your little chart with you that I handed out, and again, I just want to thank Nathan Richardson, his website, NathanRichardson.com, where I found this because it is so very, very helpful. And if you weren't confused before by all the names that seem to be repeated or little versions of it, um, I think this week is going to be the week that you're 
Fed is finally going to start spending if it's not already. But again, I think the chart is going to help. And if you're watching online, there's a link in the show notes below where you can download a copy of this. I think it'll be very helpful. And um, hopefully you can see on the screen. So this week, uh, we're going to, in, in the text in these chapters, the, the narrator sort of alternated back and forth. And, and it almost made it a little more difficult to follow because we would start in the southern kingdom, go to the northern kingdom, back to the southern kingdom, and go back and forth. So with your indulgence today, I think it might be just a little easier to sort of start and go down the kings of the northern kingdom, and then I'm going to go to the southern kingdom and talk about them. And so I think that's just going to make it a little bit easier. We're going to look at about a dozen kings, 13 I think altogether, and it's going to cover about 100 years in Israel's history. So we're instead of alternating back and forth, we're just going to do the north and then pivot to the south. Now, remember, in the north, no good kings. There were a handful in the south, but the four kings we're going to look at today, no good kings. So every king we're looking at today, they're all bad. They're all bad. Um, and, and some of them may have played the hokey pokey. They may have been in for a little bit, but then they hopped back out and showed their, their true colors. So we began with Jehoahaz, and that's the passage that I read in 2 Kings 13.2. Now, we're over here in the northern kingdom, and of course, this is when the kingdom divided. The southern kingdom, of course, that's the kingdom of David. They're all in the bloodline of David. All the kings go up and down. They, there's an arrow down, and it's a sun, and there's a bloodline, and it continues. And that's the purple dynasty of David through which the Messiah will come. But not so much the northern kingdom. And every time we see a horizontal yellow arrow, it's zigzagging back and forth. So there's no blood connection here. There may be a couple of times. And so Jehoahaz, where we're picking up right here, he is the son of Jehu. And you remember from a few weeks ago, Jehu was the guy that was anointed. He was chosen to dole out the judgment finally on the house of Ahab. And so he does that, wipes out Ahab. He becomes the king of Israel. And now we're looking at his son Jehoahaz. And that's where we're going to sort of pick up the story. And, and um, he was the son of Jehu. He reigned 17 years. And his reign is summarized in verse 2. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord by following the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit, and he did not turn away from them. Now, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. We're going to see this phrase, actually all the phrases in this verse, repeated over and over and over and over again. They're probably starting to sound familiar to you. But I just want us to note, ladies, that when it says he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, that's who really matters. You know, it doesn't, and, and the same is true for us today. It's what God thinks of us that really matters. You know, it doesn't matter if our mother says it's good or bad, or our sister says it's good or bad, or our neighbor that's peering through the curtains at us judges us and declares it good or bad. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. God is watching. And so that's what really matters. Jeroboam. And we keep referencing Jeroboam. He was that very first king of the northern kingdom. Remember, we had, we had David and then his son Solomon. And then Solomon's son Rehoboam lasted that far and couldn't keep it together. And Rehoboam wouldn't, wouldn't listen to his elders. And so the northern kingdom split away. And God actually chose Jeroboam to be anointed king of the northern kingdom. We made it just this far before it split. Jeroboam had such potential to do good. But he got too big for his brain as my Papa Charlie used to say. And he decided that to protect his kingdom, he would set up those golden calves at Bethel and Dan. Remember that? And I, that, that way the people wouldn't have to go back south to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. They can just stay up here. And of course, that meant that his kingdom would kind of be preserved and protected. And so Jeroboam was that very first king. And over and over again, we see the kings kind of following in his footsteps. There's no bloodline that goes all the way down from Jeroboam. But Jeroboam's legacy is there nevertheless because all these kings we're going to see over and over again they did evil in the eyes of the Lord they followed the sins of Jeroboam not blood relation but following in his legacy caused the people of Israel to sin and that's the greatest indictment against all these kings because to whom much is given it says in the New Testament much is required they were in a position of influence and and they were God's man and they could have influenced the people for good but they caused the people of Israel to sin and it says they 
they did not turn from that sin. A king of Israel should keep the covenant. A king of Israel should follow God and encourage the people to do the same. But every single king of the northern kingdom failed. When Aram attacked Israel, Jehoahaz supposedly had a bit of a change of heart. We saw that in verse 4. He sought the Lord's favor. The Lord listened to him. The Lord looked down and took pity. And he saw how severely Israel was being oppressed. So he was merciful. God provided a deliverer. Israel escaped the power of Aram and the people had peace. But the sad, sad indictment of Jehoahaz's reign is found in verse 6. They did not turn away from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, which he had caused Israel to commit. They continued in them, and also the Asherah pole remained standing in Samaria. So what it seems like is that Jehoahaz didn't really want God. He just wanted the help that God could provide when he got himself in a jam. When trouble came, he called on God, but he apparently chose to seek, his choice to seek the Lord didn't last. Jehoahaz sort of played the hokey pokey. He was out, in, and back out again. So he dies, and he's succeeded by his son Je Jehoash. And Jehoash reigned... 16 years, verse 11 says this about him. Whoops, okay, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and he did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. He continued in them. That should be starting to sound familiar. He did, however, and this is one good thing he did. He had the good sense to call on Elisha the prophet. Now, we haven't heard from Elisha in a while. Elisha's getting up there. He is advanced in years. He's on his deathbed. It has actually been 43 years since we've heard from Elisha. His last act recorded in scripture is when he sent the prophet to go and anoint Jehu as the next king of the northern kingdom to take out the house of Ahab and to fulfill God's judgment on the, the family of Ahab and actually Omri that, and that dynasty would end. But Elisha, even on his deathbed, even at the end of his life as he's struggling, he used his last strength to help Jehoash. And even though Jehoash had not followed God, God was still faithful to help his people. So Elisha gives Jehoash some very strange instructions. And when you read that, you probably thought, well, that's a little weird. He said, open the window and shoot. So Jehoash opened and shot the arrow out the window. And when he did, Elisha declared, you will completely destroy the Arameans at Aphek. Well, that's good news, but unfortunately, Jehoash was not spiritually discerning enough to obey Elisha's next command completely and wholeheartedly because he was then told to strike the ground with the arrows in his hand, and he only did it three times. And so when I thought that, and then I looked at Elisha's response, and Elisha was angry, I thought he was kind of half-hearted. You know, it's kind of like as a mom, but when you tell your, your kids to clean up the kitchen, and you come back in later, and they say they've done it, and there's a couple of pots on the stove, and they haven't wiped off the counters, that's kind of my pet peeve. If the counters are not wiped off, the kitchen is not clean. Or you tell, you, you, you tell your son to take the trash out to the street, and you look out, and, and it's sitting halfway down the driveway. It's half-hearted. It's not done completely, right? And so that's kind of what came to mind when I thought about, uh, about him just sort of tapping the ground three times. Yeah, whatever. It was half-hearted. And, and we know there was something awry because this is how what Elisha said to him. You should have struck the ground five or six times. And then you would have defeated Aram and completely destroyed it. But now you will only defeat it. You'll defeat it only three times. He was half-hearted. He was in and out. He was playing the hokey pokey with his obedience to God. Jehoash lacked faith. He failed to trust and believe God, and then he was succeeded by his son, Jeroboam II. So Jeroboam's legacy is not only resurfacing in behavior, but we're seeing his name come up again. So now we have Jeroboam number two, and this Jeroboam II reigned 41 years, and I think when I checked the chart, this may have been the longest reign of any king in the northern kingdom. And verse 24 says this about him. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and did not turn away from the, any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. He lived up to the reputation of his namesake. Jeroboam II was not a good king spiritually, but he did bring some economic and some military success to the northern kingdom of Israel because he was able to deliver Israel from their enemies. And it occurred to me as I read that, that perhaps just like today, citizens back then 
would kind of accept some moral compromises or some less than stellar character in their leaders so long as they brought on some military and economic success. Sometimes, ladies, there's nothing new under the sun. Jeroboam II was followed by his son, Zechariah. So if you're following along on our little chart here, we're down to the fourth king after Jehu. So it went from Jehu, his son Jehoaz, then Jehoash, Jeroboam II, and now... <coughs> We're coming to Zechariah. And so Zechariah, it, it says in verse 9, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord as his predecessors had done. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. Now he reigned only six months. He was publicly assassinated. So his death ends the dynasty of Jehu's family. And this was actually prophesied back in 2 Kings 10.30. Jehu had been told that his descendants would only reign to the fourth generation. And Je Zechariah is that fourth generation after Jehu. So this is the end of the dynasty. God always keeps his word. His assassin is Shalom. And Shalom becomes king after Zechariah. So he killed to get the throne. He reigns one month and then he's assassinated by Menahem. And so that almost seems like poetic justice, right? If you killed to get the throne, now you're killed and someone takes it away from you. And so Menahem is now the next king. And he, because he killed to get the throne, He's a pretty bad dude. Uh, the people at Tipshaw refuse to acknowledge him as king and open the gates to him. So he attacks brutally. He breaks in. Uh, he, he tears down. He, he kills his enemies. And in the tradition of the pagan Syrians, it says that he even ripped open the pregnant women. It's just, it's so hard and horrific and painful for us to even read those words. But there they are. And we need to see that to see how wicked this king was. Um, and, and, and how brutal his behavior was. So uh, can you guess how his reign is going to be summarized in verse 18? Okay, here we go. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord during his entire reign. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. He really didn't play the hokey pokey because he was never in or even pretended or tried to be in with God. He was just out. He was just a horrible, wicked king. And when the, Assyri when the Assyrians invaded, he paid them off with silver to kind of make them leave and, and it worked temporarily but as we'll soon see the Assyrians will be back they're coming back they're not going to be satisfied you paid them off but they're coming back so Menahem died. He was succeeded by his son, Pekahiah. And I'm just going to say it with confidence because I'm not sure how to pronounce it. So Pekahiah, he reigns two years. And verse 24 says this about him in chapter 15. Pekahiah did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. Then he is assassinated by one of his chief officers called Pekah. So at least we've got a variation with a couple of P names now, ladies. They're not all J's and A's. So Pekah assassinates him. Then you guessed it, Pekah becomes king. So he reigns 20 years, and you can probably guess what's said about Pekah. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. Idolatries, idolaters, every single one of them, leading the people to commit adultery. So now, during the reign of Pekah, the Assyrians, come back. They come back. And they took over the territory and they deported a bunch of the people from the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, we need to understand this is the Assyrian method of operation. This is their MO. This is what they would do. They would not just come in and conquer and say, okay, you're going to pay us tribute. They were so brutal that they wanted to destroy the culture and destroy the nationality. So what they would do, they would come in and conquer and they would haul about half the people off. They would displace a bunch of people from, the, from their native land, move a, a bunch of other people in to, to, to invade and live there, and just sort of destroy the whole national identity. They didn't just want to own you. They wanted to destroy your identity and displace you and move you. So the Assyrians were a brutal, wicked lot. And we're going to study more about them 
as we continue on in our study. But uh, Pekah was then, he was the king, uh, he was then assassinated by Hosea, and Hosea is going to become the last king of the northern kingdom. We're going to study more about him in the text that we study next week, but here we're going to, we're seeing the end of the northern kingdom. They are coming to an end. When Assyria takes over, uh, they are no more. So the, the capital of Samaria there is going to become, is, is now the whole when it's conquered, the whole land up there is going to be called Samaria, and that's the Samaritans. And when we look into the New Testament and we see why the faithful religious Jews of the South had such disdain for the Samaritans, it's because they were considered the half-breeds. They had intermarried with all the people that the Assyrians moved in. So it was a mixture of Jew and Gentile there. And, it's, and it all comes back to here. When we study the New Testament, we, we will understand now, because we've studied Samaria, Second Kings, why there was such animosity towards the people of Samaria, because they had intermarried with all these Gentile people. Okay, so we very quickly covered nine kings of the northern kingdom. I've got our chart back up there. Hopefully you have yours. We started after Jehu with his son Jehoahaz, and we went all the way to Hosea. And we're going to leave it there. We're sort of going to push pause. We're going to come back to Hosea next week, but he is the last king of the northern kingdom. Four of them, four of these nine kings we studied, committed murder to become king. None of them were good kings. A couple sort of made a half-hearted, half-baked, temporary effort to sort of give an outward appearance of following God, but they really weren't all in. They really eventually showed their true colors, and all of them did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and all of them followed in the ways of, of Jeroboam, and, and all of them led the people astray. So let's pivot now back to the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, the line of David. And so we're going to pick up right there talking about Joash. You remember he was the baby that we studied last week that was rescued by his aunt Jehosheba and, hit, and hidden away in the temple all those years until it became time for him to come out at age seven and be crowned king. Now, Joash is a sad story. I call it the Joash, the Joash tragedy. Joash. I said Joash. See, I'm getting my J's mixed up. It's the Joash tragedy. Surely he knew the story of how he was miraculously rescued when his grandmother Athaliah killed all of his siblings. He was rescued. He was hidden away. He was tutored and mentored by Jehoiada, the, the high priest, the husband of Jehosheba. His life mattered. He was rescued and, 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 and the, the kingdom of, of David was hanging by a thread. And he come, he's, he's been raised. He's been mentored by this godly mentor and he had everything going for him and, and his, his example of having so much potential and beginning well and ending very poorly. Now we don't have time to, to look at him completely so I've already recorded devotional to post next week and I hope you'll watch that uh, because there's not enough time to drill down every week on all the little themes that we want to look at. But I think that the Joe Ash tragedy speaks today to women who have prodigals in their family. Women who did everything right like Jehoiada and raised them to know the Lord and raised them to know the truth and they get up out from under mom and daddy's household or he gets up and after Jehoiada dies and, and the influence of his godly mentor is gone, he sort of went sideways. It's a sad ending. And so... Joash was murdered by two of his officials to avenge the death of Zechariah. So when he starts making some poor decisions, Zechariah, who is the son of Jehoiada, the high priest, and Zechariah steps up and calls him out. And, and, and calls him out on what he's doing. And what does Joash do but have him murdered? And it occurred to me as I was studying that, that because Zechariah was Jehoiada's son, they probably do, grew up together. Almost as brothers, perhaps, because Jehoshiba and Jehoiada were like his surrogate parents since everybody else in his family had been killed. He was raised in the temple. He probably grew up next to Zechariah. And so instead of receiving truth from his friend and his sort of brother and the son of his mentor, he just has him killed. He has him killed. And so, uh, so he's murdered by two of his officials to avenge the death of Zechariah. Joash was succeeded by his son Amaziah, and like his father, he began somewhat well. Now, don't confuse Amaziah with Ahaziah, right? Ahaziah is the one that was the grandson of both Jehoshaphat and the grandson of um, 
of Ahab that goes up with his uncle and gets killed in the, in the crosshairs of Jehu's judgment on the house of Ahab. And Ahaziah is the one who, after he's killed, uh, uh, Athaliah, his, his mother, grabs the kingdom. And so he's gone. Ahaziah, that, that was a couple generations ago. Then we have Joash, and now we have Amaziah. So that, that would be kind of be a fun name. Amaziah the Amazing, but maybe not so much because it says... Uh, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not as his father David had done. And everything he followed the example of his father Joash. So he becomes king at age 29. He ruled 29 years. And he was more like his father Joash than he was like his, I don't know how many greats back, great, great, how many greats grandfather David. So he did some good, tried to kind of be like David, but he was more like Joash. And we've already saw how Joash ended poorly. Verse 4 says that during his reign, the high places were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense. Now, Amaziah did attack Edom to regain some territory. Uh, that was a good thing. But he kind of used a wrong method because he hired 100,000 mercenaries from the godless, idol-worshipping northern kingdom to bolster his army of 300,000. He, he, he looked around. He thought, I need more soldiers. I'm just going to hire some from up north. So he trusts in man's ways instead of relying upon God. He took matters into his own hand instead of seeking the blessing and help of the Lord. So when he did that, he was contacted by a prophet from God who said this, to him. And these words are found over in 2 Chronicles. And this is what the prophet said to him, Your Majesty, these troops from Israel must not march with you, for the Lord is not with Israel, not, not with any of the people of Ephraim. Even if you go and fight courageously in battle, God will overthrow you before the enemy, for God has the power to help or overthrow. He's trying to get his attention. You don't need help from these hirelings up north. You need help from God. He's the one with the power. He can help you. Call upon the Lord. But Amaziah's response to this man of God that speaks such words of wisdom to him? Does he have a teachable spirit? Here's what he says, verse 9a. But what about these hundred talents I paid for these Israelite troops? You know, I've already spent the money on this. Well, what about that? Do I just lose out on my money? You know, ladies, I read that and I thought, you know, when we are convicted, we look at that and we mock him, but do we respond the same way? When the Holy Spirit says, you don't need to be reading this. Is your next thought, well, but I paid good money for this New York Times bestseller. I even splurged for the hardback version, you know. <clears throat> or when the Holy Spirit whispers, you shouldn't be watching this. Do you think, yeah, well, I'm already here at the theater and I've even got a whole thing of popcorn that I bought, you know. When he says, you shouldn't be eating this, you think, well, I've already paid for this meal. And, and uh, what, what, what would obeying God look like in that moment of conviction when that small voice in your ear is not an overactive conscience, but it's the Holy Spirit trying to look out for you? Well, when, you know, when I read all that, I thought about God's power being on display. When the man of God said, you don't need 100,000 extra troops. You just need God. And I was thinking about Gideon back in Judges. Do you remember when he, he was going to go and fight and he had 32,000 troops and God kept paring it down and paring it down and paring it down to where <clears throat> he had less than 1% of what he started with. God sent Gideon into battle with 300 men. That's all he needed. And, and, and why did God only want him to go in with just a few? Because he wanted to be sure that everybody knew that God was getting the glory, that it was God who provided the victory. And that's what, that's what needed to happen here. He needed to hear from that prophet to know that it was God who could help him at that moment. It didn't matter how much money he'd already spent. Send him home. Don't use those guys. We're in that same situation. When the Holy Spirit whispers to us, you don't need this. You shouldn't be watching this. You shouldn't be doing that. What would obeying God look like for us in that moment? Well, if we have a half-hearted response or we want to argue with God, we might just sort of say, well, I won't do it again. Just this one time, God. Next time, I'll, I just won't do it again. I'll just finish this chapter and then I'll throw the book in the trash. Well, God, next time before I go to the movies, I promise I'll read the reviews ahead of time. Well, it'd just be wasteful to throw the rest of this food away, you know, even though I'm kind of full with half the dessert if I 
you know, just be wasteful to throw it in the trash. And, or, or this meal is not as good if it's warmed up. You know, what, ladies, when conviction comes, if we're going to be wholehearted all in, it's what we do next that counts. We're going to be tempted. We're going to fall. We're going to find ourselves in situations. And when that voice whispers in our ear, it's not where we are. It's what we do next that counts. How do we listen to how do we listen to the Holy Spirit in that moment? And, and if we find ourselves in a place where we've just sort of squelched the Holy Spirit and we've not listened over and over again, and then we come to a place and we think, I, I just don't feel like I'm hearing from God anymore. Well, maybe we need to cycle back and do the last thing that he told us to do. Because when we listen to his voice and obey him, we live and abide in that place of blessing. Is he the God of everything in our lives? Is he the God of every day? Is he not just the God in the hospital when there's COVID or cancer or when there's chemo? Or is he also the God of my what I'm watching on television and what I'm doing with my time and what I'm choosing to let my eyes see? Is he the God of my conversations with my girlfriends. The prophet said to Amaziah, the Lord can give you much more than that. A hundred talents is nothing to God. God can replace that and so much more. And the Lord can give us so much more when we obey him, ladies. Our obedience brings blessing. Maybe not blessing the way the world counts blessing, but blessing in the very best way. You and I have to decide what kind of women we want to choose to be. Are we going to be all in? Or are we going to be halfway in? Is he going to be God of everything? Or God of just the little bit that I choose to let him be Lord over? Are you and I playing the hokey pokey with God? Are we in one day and out the next? Are we obeying and then disobeying? So although Amaziah chose to obey and sent those mercenary troops back to Israel, he was not fully devoted to God. Second Chronicles 25.2 sums up his life. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not wholeheartedly. But not wholeheartedly. Are you all in? Am I all in when it comes to serving God and obeying God? Are we following God half-heartedly? Can we pray and ask him, Lord, show me. I want a woman up and say, show me where I'm holding out and holding back. Are we 10% in or 20% or 60% or are we, are we all in wholehearted in our devotion to the Lord, serving him, wanting to serve him always and in all ways. Psalm 119.80 says, may I wholeheartedly follow your decrees that I may not be put to shame. Following half-hearted, being in, being out, playing the hokey pokey, that will eventually bring shame and regret. It will have us living less when God has more for us. Because here's the thing, we were created to bring him glory. That's why you're on this planet. You were created to make much of God. And anything less of that, shoving him off the throne, living for yourself, is going to bring a life that's less than satisfying. I think it was John Piper who said, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Is your life lacking some satisfaction? Maybe it's because you're living for yourself and holding out on God. When we choose to woman up and be women who live all in for him, it's the most satisfying, sweet spot, place that we want to live because we're, we're fulfilling our purpose to bring glory to God. Can we commit to wholehearted devotion of God? Because the woman of God follows God wholeheartedly. She's all in. Now hear me, ladies. It's not about being perfect. It's not about keeping a, a list or a legalistic behavior checklist. It's about a heart change from the inside out. We're not talking about keeping a little list on the outside and checking the box. When our hearts are all in, when God has our hearts, then all the behaviors and the words and the actions and the attitudes, they're going to naturally follow suit. But it, it, it's not a have to. That's going to give way as transformation and sanctification comes. It's no longer have to. It becomes want to when your heart is changed. It becomes delight to. It becomes who you are on the inside and it makes its way to the outside. Conviction from a good God through the Holy Spirit that he sent to dwell in us, that doesn't bring a little saucy two-year-old tantrum like God wants to steal my joy. It doesn't bring a 14-year-old equivalent of tossing the head or rolling the eyes when that conviction comes and, and it doesn't bring uh, the behavior of a, I'm an adult on the outside checking the box either. It brings a 
woman of God response, a grateful heart that says, yes, Lord, I want to bring you glory because I love you. A heart that is willing to lean into faithful obedience and to trust that God who brought the conviction is also going to provide the ability to obey and the blessing when we do obey it. That's a heart that's bringing glory to God. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's make 8611, Psalm 8611, our prayer. Teach me your way, Lord. I want to learn your way. And I believe that all of you in this room today want to learn his way. That's why you've committed yourself to being a student of the word. That, that I may rely on your faithfulness, not on my faithfulness, not on my hiring troops from the north or coming up with, with human ways to... to tackle spiritual problems. Give me an undivided heart, not a heart that's half here and half there and in and out. God, give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name, that I may revere you, that I may bring you glory. God, give us that undivided heart. All in, always, and in all ways. Amaziah's divided heart led to poor decisions, and he was eventually assassinated, and his son Azariah, or Uzziah, became king at age 16. Azariah or Uzziah ruled 52 years and 2 Kings 15.2 says this about him. He was 16 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. His mother's name was Jecoliah. She was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord just as his father Amaziah had done. Just as his father Amaziah had done says a whole lot. You know if you're learning from your daddy and your daddy was half in then you know how, how, what's your obedience going to look like? You know what, you've probably heard it said that what we do in moderation, our children will, will do in excess. So if all these kings in the last couple have looked at their father, they, they followed the ways of their father, not the, 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 perhaps the ways of God. If we filled this room with pianos and we decided to tune the second piano to the first one, the first one's in tune, we tune the second one to the first and the third to the second and the fourth to the third and all the way down. By the time we get all the way around the room, that piano is not going to be in tune. You got to have a tuning fork. You got to have a standard. And so, if there, if each of these kings is just judging himself by the standard set by his daddy and not by the covenant of God Almighty, then you see where you end up: half baked, half in. The caveat, just as his father Amaziah had done, tells us a whole lot about Azariah. His prideful choices brought on God's judgment because he was afflicted with leprosy. Then he succeeded by his son Jotham. And <clears throat> here again, this might be helpful because they're all father's sons now. We're going right down the line. We're in the southern kingdom of Judah in the line of David. And so we've gone from Amaziah to Uzziah, or, and, and now we're going to uh, Jotham. <clears throat> Jotham. 2 Kings 15.34 summarizes Jotham's life and reign. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Uzziah had done. So again, he's going to be out of tune with God if he's using his daddy as the standard, and his daddy used the standard of his daddy before him. The apple isn't fallen far from the tree. I'm mixing lots of metaphors, I guess. So just as his father Uzziah had done. Half-hearted and again playing the hokey pokey in and out and, and only halfway in. Verse 35 confirms his halfway in because it says the high places were not removed. The people continued to offer sacrifices and burn incense there. The end of chapter 15 says God is fixing to bring judgment also on the house of Judah. Now we talked about the Assyrians came took over the northern kingdom. They're fixing to be completely gone, but it's going to happen to the southern kingdom as well. Verse 37 says, the judgment is beginning. In those days, the Lord began to send Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, against Judah. So Aram is Syria. Pekah, well, that's the king of the northern kingdom, and they're coming for Judah. So there are outside forces that are going to come in. God is going to judge even the southern kingdom. And the last king we're going to look at today... And I can hear you saying amen under your breath, so I, I know what you're thinking, is Ahaz, the son of Jotham. And uh, chapter 16, verse 2 says this about him. Unlike David, his father, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. So he made no effort. He wasn't halfway in and halfway out. He was just out. Verse 3 goes on to say this. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel. So he's, he's a southern king of, he's a king of the southern kingdom of Judah, but he's looking <clears throat> to the north for his behavior. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel and even sacrificed his son in the fire. 
engaging in the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. Idolatry, pagan behavior, and even child sacrifice. It is horrific. It's really nauseating. That, the, that, that God's people would wander so far that they're not changing the culture, the culture is changing them. It's hard to imagine Ahaz being part of the lineage of David. David, the man after God's own heart. Well, we followed the kings of Judah <clears throat> from David down to Ahaz. Some were good kings. Uh, some were half-hearted. Some, like Ahaz, wanted nothing to do with God. And we've looked at the lives of we've looked at the lives of 13 kings today. Nine from the northern kingdom and four from the southern kingdom of Judah. But none of them are considered good, according to the the little chart in our study guide that puts a little asterisk there by the ones that that are that scholars consider good. Some might uh, give some partial credit for those that are have kind of been half-hearted or who did what was right but did not remove the high places. But um, but really, did, if they didn't follow God wholeheartedly and they allowed idolatry to commit, they're really, they're really all bad. So when we look at each of these kings and, and we see all these names, the question we might ask is, well, now, was he a good king or a bad king? You know, and, and we realize that even those who were labeled good weren't really completely good. All they had to do was keep the covenant to receive God's blessing and favor. And remember as David passed the baton to Solomon, what he told him? He gave him this charge. He said to his son Solomon, walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that, there's the so that, do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go. Walk in his ways, Solomon. Keep his decrees and commands, Solomon, and receive God's blessing, Solomon. But Solomon couldn't do it. Just like the very first man and the very first woman, God created a place of perfection and beauty for Adam and Eve. And they just had one rule to keep. You're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For, for when you eat from it, you'll surely die. Just one rule. Adam and Eve couldn't keep it. When God rescued his people from rescued his people from Egypt and prepared for them to come into the promised land and he spoke to them through Joshua, he said, "Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it and then you will be prosperous and successful." As God defines prosperity and success. All they had to do was believe and obey and they could not do it. And you know what, ladies? We can't do it either. When the question is asked of us, <clears throat> are we good girls or bad girls? The answer is that like Adam and Eve and like the Israelites who crossed the Jordan and like all these kings of Israel and Judah that we've studied, we are all bad. We play the hokey pokey. We're out and we're in and we're out again. James 2.10 says, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point, he's guilty of breaking all of it. We're all guilty. But when we acknowledge our sin and our need for Jesus Christ, it's the cross that sets us free. Though we are guilty, we are declared righteous in Jesus Christ. We are declared good in the eyes of the Lord because of our identity with Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. We are justified through the cross of Christ. His death, burial, and resurrection has us who are good, who are bad, declared good. Romans 5.8 offers this blessed news that makes us so profoundly grateful that God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were still sinners, he died for us. We don't have to clean ourselves up before coming to him. We don't have to check all the boxes and, and come to him and, and, and pretend that we're the good girls that on the outside that we know we're not on the inside. We don't have to get our act together before coming to him. Do you believe that Jesus died for you? Have you found eternal life in him? Because he died for us, we have the great blessing of living for him. Not to earn our salvation, but because we're already saved. Because our identity is in him. Our obedience is not prompted by some effort to earn our salvation. We already have that. It's prompted by love. We obey him because we love him. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commands. Because we love Jesus, we will keep his commands. And as a result, when we make those day-to-day -day choices 
listening to that voice that whispers in our ear, in our hearts, in our minds, when we obey him, we find that the evil one loses his grip over one more area. God has made God over one more area in our lives. We're transformed, we're changed, we're sanctified, and God is glorified in us. We're living wholehearted. We're living all in. We're living like we're loved. We grow up from being little girls who play the hokey pokey with one foot in and then back out, and we choose to honor him out of love and out of gratitude. It's not easy. The Christian life is not the easiest life but the pastor I sat under for many years said it is the best life it truly is the best life it's the most blessed way to live because it's a life that's devoted to glorifying him and that's why you're here you were created to bring him glory and when you make those choices and you decide to be all in and live wholehearted that's what you do you bring him glory following him and obeying him simply because we love him brings him great glory let's pray god almighty we want to bring you glory we want to be women who are wholehearted, women who live with undivided hearts, women who listen attentively for your voice and then run quick to obey where you're leading us, not because we are afraid of you striking us with lightning, but because we love you and we want to please you. You have saved us and redeemed us through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, because you died for us, Jesus. We want to live for you always and in all ways ways to bring you glory, wholehearted, all in, undivided. We are yours. Father, let us hear your voice and follow where you lead because we love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.